Welcome everybody to the sixth lecture on signal processing. Uh, you can find this as one of a series of lectures on very introductory concepts to signal processing, sort of the basic mathematical architecture of what we want to do to understand how inputs and outputs happen in systems and how we think about signal processing in general. So uh, this lecture, we're going to start thinking about one of the most important types of systems, what are called linear time invariant systems, or oftentimes LTI systems. So these two properties, which we've already talked about different properties of these uh, that we can have in systems, we're now bringing together two of them, which is the linearity property and the time invariance, to start studying a class of systems that become very important for us in practical applications. So those are the two concepts we want to bring together. Remember, linearity is just uh, essentially, it's going to allow us then to construct solutions, and if we have solutions, we can add them and make new solutions. So we have that property that's critically important. Uh, more than that, for these linear systems, we're going to have exponentials as our solution form. So this is going to be really important for us as well, which is we can actually write down analytic solutions that are just simple exponentials. And the exponentials can have complex parts. So if it has an imaginary component, sines and cosines, which are going to be the basis of a lot of our signal processing. Time invariance is really referring to the fact that if I take this system, how it behaves when I interact with it at some time t0 is the same as if I interacted it at time t equals 10. So it doesn't really matter when I interact with the system. It interacts the same. Systems that are not time invariant are much more difficult. It means that they are changing in time so that how, you, how the system behaves at time zero is different than how the system is going to be behaving at time 10. So at that point, you're going to have to really have a much more sophisticated way to handle that problem. But time invariant systems, the origin of time essentially does not matter. And a key thing that's going to happen here is when we have these time invariance and linearity together, these LTI systems, we're going to have the concept of linear superposition hold. So what linear superposition allows us to do is going to say, if I have a solution, I have another solution, I can add those solutions any way I wish, I still have a solution. So you can't underestimate how important this linear superposition principle is. In fact, most of advances in science that we've done in quantum, electrodynamics, acoustics, all of this, these are linear models where we've used linear superposition as one of the most foundational principles for building understanding of a system that we have in mind. It's no different here for these LTI systems. So let's first talk about discrete time LTI systems. And one of the things that we want to first understand is the delta function. So the delta function is a kick to the system. And the way we're going to construct all of our solutions is we're going to essentially kick the system and look at its response. And by understanding that, and if it doesn't matter if it's time invariant, it doesn't matter when I kick the system, the response is going to be the same. And then I'm going to build solutions out of that. So we're going to start making use of the delta function. And the delta function has this interesting sifting property. So what it does is if you take any function and multiply it by a delta function, it's wherever the argument is 0. So the argument here is 0 when n is equal to minus 1. So this function here is 0 everywhere except for n equals minus 1, which means the only point of this function that matters is when x is minus 1. So one way to think about it, I multiply by the delta function. It sifts out the value of this x at one position, which is where the kick happens. So another way of representing that is here. All other values are 0 except for the one here at n equals 1. Here's another version of it. Notice that if I kick this thing at n equals 0, now I pull out x equals 0. I kick it at n equals 1, I pull out x equals 1. So notice this sifting property for this discrete function, it simply pulls out the value of the function wherever I kicked it, at whatever index I kicked it. So the nice thing about having a linear system is that if I have this delta function construct, I can actually represent any signal in terms of a series of a sum of delta functions. So for instance, here's a signal, x of n, a discrete signal. And I can re represent this as simply the value of each position against the delta function. So for instance, here, at n equals minus 3, it sifts out the value of x minus 3. 
and I add to it the value at n minus two, x minus two. And I add to that the value at x minus one and at n minus one and so forth. So in other words, these delta functions are progressively sifting out the value of x and representing as a sum of delta functions, all of which are being shifted by one n. So this is a different way to represent a function. And what we're gonna do in LTI system is we're gonna understand that if I put in a signal, what I really wanna know is what is the response into the system by having a kick, for instance, x, x equals minus three, at equals minus two. And if I understand the fundamental response, I can build a solution by linearly adding all these responses together, and that is my construct for the solution. So let's get into this a little bit. This is the representation of what I just wrote down, which is this x of n, right, is equal to a sum x of k times the value sifted out at n equals k, okay? So this is just gonna give me exactly this representation here, but in a much more compact form, and it's a very general representation. And the reason we like this representation is because what we're gonna start understanding is a signal x, n, is gonna go into a system, and we wanna understand what comes out, let's call it y of n, and what I wanna understand is that each x of n is a kick to the system producing a response and my total response at the end will be a sum of all of these kicks and how they're acting at different points in time. Okay, so that's that's what this represents right here. All right, so let's just do this graphically, show a picture of this. So here is some signal x of n, it takes on some values, you can see them there from negative values, positive values. And so if I take this x of n, and I say, okay, what is the value of this thing at x equals minus two? Here it is, it's this spike here, and you can see it right there. And if I wanna sift this out, all I have to do is multiply by delta n plus two. So when n is minus two, everybody is zero except for this point here, which takes on this value there, okay? And if I wanna pull the next point in, x minus one, I just multiply by delta n plus one, and it pulls out the value at minus one, which you can see right there as well, okay? And finally here, at x equals zero, I pull this out just by multiplying x zero times delta n, so it sifts the value at n equals zero, which is here, and is right there as well. So you could see this delta function is just a very handy uh, mathematical object for pulling out very specific values, right? It targets the value whenever the argument here is zero. And it'll pull out one specific value. So that's the sifting property of the delta function we're gonna use in our signal processing operations. Okay, so what we wanna understand now is when we think about these LTI systems, we wanna think now about this signal coming in, the x of k's, and producing an output y sub n's, okay? So we're gonna put in a signal and we're gonna look at the corresponding output. So y sub n, isn't just the output isn't just what happened when I kicked it now, you also have the responses from everything that was happening before. So oftentimes you have a time history here. So when we look at this thing here, x of kn is gonna be a very important object for us to think about. What x of kn is, it is the response to a kick at delta n minus k. In other words, when n is equal to k, this is a kick, and here is the response. The response does not have to be instantaneous. I could kick a system and then something happens that decays in time. And often this is the case, right? I kick the system, there is a response that decays. And so what you're looking at here then is my solution to the output is when I kick it, I look at the response to each kick and I add them up. So if I kick it at time zero, there is a response. And now I kick it at time one, it has a response that I add to my previous response at time zero. I kick it at time t equals two, I add it to the response at time zero, time one, now at time two. So that is how you would think about this summation. It is the sum of all the kicks that you've put into the system. All right, so for instance, we can have at different points in time, different kicks that produce different responses. So in this case here, I'm showing you an example of a 
a system that's not time invariant because here's an input signal. There's a negative kick here, positive kick and a positive kick. And what these are here, h of minus one, this is a response to a kick at minus one. In other words, if this is the kick, this is the unit response to that kick. If I kick it at zero, here is their unit response. And I kick it at one, here is the unit response. They're all different. Okay, so in other words, each time I kick it, I get a different response, which means that this is not a time invariant system. But this is kind of this representation. Once I understand what the kicks are coming, how it responds, then my total solution is if I sum all of these together um, as, I do, as I kick this at different times. Okay, so that is going to be the concept of LTI, or at least linear systems, I can sum them. And what we're going to look at in a linear time invariant system is that every time I kick it, I get exactly the same response, which is not what I've shown you here, but a linear time invariant system, all the responses are the same. So in other words, what it's going to do, a linear time invariant system, is going to take this kick here, okay, h of k, which is some kick at some point, and I'm going to assume that all of them are exactly the same. Let's call this h naught. So h naught is sort of our fundamental response to a kick. So a time invariant system, it does not matter when you kick it, the response is the same, and that response is H naught, okay? So this is this notation becomes very important. Oftentimes, we just call H naught H, and so this H of N is the response to a kick delta N. So notice I take that unit kick delta N, and the response to the system is H of N, okay? So it doesn't matter when I kick it, because I can just change n to any arbitrary argument. So it could be three, it could be five, it could be negative two. I get, that's the response to a kick at the corresponding delta function kick at negative one, three, five, whatever it happens to be. Okay, so the fact that this h is the same for any kick, that's what makes it time invariant. And so, what you're going to do then in this LTI system is your solution to this. Uh, here it is, y of n. The output of this uh, system is going to be h of k, which is the kick, where you give the kick, times the response that that kick induces. So h of k, you kick the system. h is the response to that. I now move forward one bin in time, or n. I kick it again, I get a response, and I add it to my previous solution. So, and I just keep doing this, and I keep summing the responses. That's what it means to have a linear system, is that I can actually take one solution, add it to another solution, add it to another solution, and it's still a solution. So that's what this is. The sum is you're gonna walk over all the kicks, and H is the response, it's the same response, no matter when you kick it, the system behaves the same, that's what H is telling you how it behaves. Okay, so let's, uh, let's walk through this a little bit. Here's some examples of what you might see. So for instance, you might say, here's a kick at X is minus one, N equal minus one. Okay, so you give it a kick, and maybe here is the response. There's a response that you might get out of that system. So from going from here to here is through this function H. So that's the output of that kick. Same thing here, I kick it here, here is the response. I kick it here, here is the response. Again, you might get very different responses in time and they're characterized by H minus one, H naught, H one, and so forth. If all the responses are the same, then it is a time invariant system. But here again, generically, I can still add the solutions, but this is clearly not a time invariant system. All right. So let's actually look at a time invariant system, and here's a simple example of this. I'm gonna give you two important pieces of information. One, my input signal, which is zero, and at zero it's 0 0.5, and at one it's two. So I'm gonna kick it, I have with this response, that's my input signal, and what I ask is, what's gonna come out as a response to this? So first of all, I have to know how the system responds to a kick, and this is what I'm giving you up here. H of n is the response to a kick at zero. 
And notice I've said H of N, so this is the fundamental response. So no matter how I kick it, wherever I kick it, what happens is until the kick happens, it's zero. Once the kick happens, one, 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 then goes back to zero. In other words, I turn it on. That's one way to view this. I turn it on for three points and it goes off. This is the fundamental response for this time invariant system. And so now I'm gonna run a signal that looks like this through it and ask the question, what is the response or the solution of the system? So let's start thinking about this. So as I move forward in N, when I get to here in the signal, in other words, at N equals zero, I kick it at 0.5. Well, the response of the signal is this, but now it has a factor of 0.5 in front. So initially the signal comes on and that's what I get out, okay? Now advance n equals one, right? So if I now advance n equals one and I say, okay, what happens here? Well, if I kicked it here with strength two, this is the response. So in total, I have two kicks here and here with strength 0.5, strength 0.2. And so this is a response to the one, this is a response to the other. My total response is the sum of these, which is given by here. I just add those together. Take this and this, add it together. This is what you get. It goes from height 0.5 to 2.5 to 2 back to 0. Okay? So once you understand the fundamental response and you tell me what signal is coming in, you can just simply add these together. Okay? That is the idea of this LTI system. And this is why we like LTI systems. They're very easy and convenient to use. They have these beautiful properties of just adding solutions together and oftentimes if you can give me the fundamental response I just glue together a bunch of fundamental response all shifted so right the only difference between here and here is that it's shifted by n equals one but I just add it together to get my final response which is here okay that's a very simple example but it kind of highlights for us exactly what we want to do in trying to understand LTI systems so LTI systems the beauty of them is that I'm going to kick the system and the delta function becomes a very important piece of this because if I understand how the system responds to my kick, all I do is I look at my input signal. Each point of that signal gives my system a kick and I can just add up all those outputs or those responses together to form the solution at the end of this thing. So that concludes this lecture. The next lecture, we're going to talk about these kicking mechanisms. This was all focused on the discrete case. The next lecture will focus on the continuous case so we can understand both, uh, both paradigms. But it's no different. It's just that we're going to take these sums and we're instead we're going to trade out for integrals and integrate over all of this, which is exactly adding up all the signals together.